Uh, I greet you all saints in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, today we are going to be having a, a very, very important study. Uh, what we are going to be studying about actually is something that is very important, number one. But number two, it's something that is very, very highly neglected. Uh, but God says that this thing, it is a prerequisite for us in order for us to receive the seal of God. Now, it's not the knowledge of what we are going to be studying about that is the prerequisite. Are you with me? But it is the, the practice, the doing of what we are going to be studying about. But even the knowledge, says, like I'm saying, it is something that is highly neglected. And I believe that the neglect is not planned. It's not on purpose. Are you with me? But it is just that it is something that is not really spoken of that much. And so it is that Satan has actually stolen in and he has taken that to, to his advantage. So that when the time comes for the stamp to be impressed upon us, the seal of God, we are found unprepared, unprepared. But we are going to be studying about this by God's grace. So this is very, very important. But also before we, we jump into that study, we are going to look at something that is connected with it. And that is the fact that probation is soon about to close. I believe very, very fully from the things that are taking place, uh, from the word of God and from the inspired testimonies, that the close of probation saints, it is imminent. It is imminent. Now, someone might say, oh, but you, you see, this is, this is not right because no one knows when it will close. Now, listen to this quotation. There's a quotation in Great Controversy, page 594. It says that the events, the events connected with the close of probation have been clearly revealed. Are you with me? Let's pause there. So we are told that the events connected with the close of probation have been what? clearly revealed now not the time i don't know the time are you with me but inspiration is telling us that there are certain events that have been clearly revealed in the bible and the spirit of prophecy so that if you you see these events you may know that probation is about to close or you may even know that probation has closed are you with me we're told that these events are clearly revealed not shadily revealed or revealed in an unclear fashion. Are you with me? Mm -mm. This is not the place where the spirit of prophecy says silence is elo eloquent. No, 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 no. This is clearly revealed. So we need to be speaking about it. But the quotation continues and says, But multitudes have no more a knowledge of those events as if they have never been revealed. Are you with me? So multitudes do not know concerning these events which reveal that probation is soon about to close. Saints, we are truly, truly at the end. We are truly at the what? At the end. You know, when you read your Bible in the book of Ezekiel chapter 7, in verse 6, the Bible says, An end is come. The end is come. It watcheth for thee. Behold, it is come. Are you with me? And to, do and to those who are unprepared, the end is coming against them. The phrase there it's where it says, it watcheth for thee, it means it is coming against you. And Satan would have it so, saints, that when the end comes, the end of probationary time comes, it is against us and not for us. Are you with me? But Jesus, because of his great love for the souls of man, because of his great love for sinners like you and me, Jesus is bringing us messages of warning, saints. You know, Jesus did not consider heaven a place to be desired while we were lost. Are you with me? Then you may best be assured that Jesus will do everything that he can do to save us. Even bringing messages like these to expose, to expose the tricks of the enemy. Now, when you read also in the book of Zephaniah, notice this verse. Zephaniah chapter 1 in verse 14, the Bible says, the great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. Do you hear that? It says that day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress. So Zephaniah is identifying this day in verse 15. He says that this is the day of trouble. So this is speaking about the, the time of trouble. Are you with me, saints? And we are told that it is hastening greatly. 
And on that day, saints, we are told that the mighty men are going to cry tears. They're going to weep bitterly. Now, these verses that I've just read in Ezekiel and Zephaniah, these are actually uh, God's testimonies uh, to ancient Israel when their probation was about to close because of their impenitence and because of their rebellion. When they were about to experience a destruction sense that, that they had never seen before. Are you with me? So these were God's testimonies to them. But these things actually they apply even more to us than, than to them. How do I know that? When you read in 1 Corinthians 10 in verse 11. Paul says something interesting. He says now all these things happen unto them for ensamples. Are you with me? What is ensamples? Patterns, patterns, meaning the things that happened to ancient Israel, they happened to them for patterns, for patterns, meaning they are going to be repeated again. But when are they going to be repeated? And it is patterns for who? The, the verse continues, it says, now all these things happen unto them for and samples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Are you with me, saints? So these are patterns for us living in the end of the world. So these things are speaking more for our time than for their time back then. So when we hear of the fact that the end is come, it is speaking to us. When we hear of the day of the Lord that it is hastening greatly, it is speaking to us. Are you with me, saints? Now let us see what inspiration has to say about this. Because... Many people don't see what is coming, saints. And we are told that it is hastening greatly. You know, when you read in Acts of the Apostles, page 260, we are told that the signs of the end are rapidly fulfilling. Hmm? And the world is hastening to the time when the Son of Man shall be revealed in the clouds of heaven. So we are told that these things are fulfilling not slowly, but rapidly. Now, that is saying to you and me, Whatever preparation we are making, uh, trying to get ready for these events, we should be doing it also very quickly because the signs are also taking place very quickly. Now, that is what Zephaniah is saying, that is what Elenite is saying, and that is what is taking place since the signs are happening rapidly, rapidly, so, so rapidly. Notice this quotation. Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 335. Notice what it says. It says, prophecy is slowly fulfilling. Is that what it's saying? No, no. It says, prophecy is fast fulfilling. It says, less. What is that what it's saying? Mm -mm. More. Much more should be said about these tremendously important subjects. The day is at hand when the destiny of every soul will be fixed forever. That is the destiny of your parents, the destiny of your family, the destiny of your children, the destiny of your, of your church mates, of your brothers, of your neighbors. We need to think about it carefully, saints. And what we're going to be studying, that requirement for the seal that I mentioned in the beginning, it is connected with this. The fixing of the destinies of everyone forever. It continues and says, the false watchmen are raising the cry, all is well, but the day of God is rapidly approaching. Its footsteps are so muffled that it does not arouse the world from the death-like slumber into which it has fallen. Do you hear that? So we're told that the day is coming very quickly, but also the day is coming very silently, so that most people don't realize that it is coming. They continue to sleep on to their destruction. And somebody needs to wake us up. Are you with me? Somebody needs to wake up the multitudes that are asleep, saints. False watchmen, we are told, are raising the cry that it is well when it is not well. We need to be careful, saints, of false watchmen. To be very very careful now how do we know how do we know that the close of probation is soon about to take place how do you know that we are at the end someone might be asking like as i mentioned in the beginning 
It is from the, the event. But listen to the words of Jesus. In Matthew 24, in verse 32, Jesus says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put it forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see these things, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. Are you with me? So Jesus says that when we see all of these things taking place, we may know that his coming, the close of probation, is near even at the door. Now, I want us to underline that word, no. It says, when you see these things, no. It doesn't say guess or think. Are you with me, saints? So, Jesus, what Jesus is saying is that the signs of the times that he has given to us from the Bible and from the spirit of prophecy, they are so accurate and they are so dependable that when you see them taking place, you are not... Uh, in the realm of guessing, are you with me? You are taken outside the realm of uh, the realm of guessing and speculation, and you can know for sure. Now, this is Jesus speaking, saints. If Jesus knew that the signs that he has given us uh, can be falsified and they are not reliable, Jesus might have said, "When you see these signs, uh, you may now begin to suspect that the end is here." Are you with me? But he says, "No." You, like, there is no way you can be wrong if you study the signs properly. And the signs are telling us, saints, that we are at the, the end. Now, let me ask you. The signs that show the things uh, are at a close, are we the only ones that know them? Like, as God's children, like, as, as Bible-reading and Bible-believing people, uh, are we the only ones that know them? Or, or let me rather say, are we the only ones that can discern and see the signs taking place? Well, since it's not the case, it's a no. It's a no. And let me just read for you a quotation. And I'm going to remind you of a particular example in history. Listen to this quotation. Uh, Prophets and Kings, page 537. says, the present is a time of overwhelming interest to all living. Says rulers and state, statesmen, men who occupy positions of trust and authority, thinking men and women of all classes, are you with me? Have their attention fixed upon the events taking place about us. They are watching the relations that exist among the nations. They observe the intensity that is taking place that is taking possession of every earthly element, and they recognize that something great and decisive is about to take place. That the world is on the verge of a stupendous crisis. Do you hear that? So very plainly, we are not the only ones who can see that there are events taking place which show us that we are on the verge of a stupendous crisis, saints. We are not the only ones that see these events. And do you remember uh, in the times of Christ that the word thinking man, when Christ was born, there were thinking men. Hmm? who knew that the Messiah, the Savior of the world, has been born. But when they came, they found the church of God asleep. The thinking men could see these things. The thinking men could what? They would see these things and they believed them. And they walked such a long distance. Are you with me? And when they came, they found Israel asleep. Oh, saints, this is, this is a tragedy. And this happened for an ensemble. And it is written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. In the end of the world, the thinking man will be seeing things that the church fast asleep is not discerning. Are you with me? Let us look at something now. I want us to see something that thinking men are speaking about today and what they are saying about it. Have you ever, have you ever heard about uh, the doomsday clock? The doomsday clock. This is just a picture, uh, I would say an exaggerated picture of the clock. But this is what the clock uh, looks like. Those are a group of scientists standing next to the, to the doomsday clock. Now, let me not say, but let me read the doomsday clock. Actually, it is, it is a, I would say it's, 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 it's a program 
uh, that was founded by scientists in in 1947 and amongst those scientists was actually albert einstein as well uh, and this this program as you can see here on wikipedia uh, this program is basically studying a lot of factors so this is where scientists they meet they study a lot of factors you can see at the end uh, the main factors uh, influencing the clock are nuclear warfare climate change and artificial in intelligence so those are the main factors but not only factors so what the scientists do is that they study all of these things very diligently and thoroughly and they they tabulate them they put them in graphs and they they, they do simulations and they look at history as well and as they do all of these exercises they then come up with a with a prediction which they actually map out on the clock, the doomsday clock. So that is, this is what they began in 1947. Now this doomsday clock, since it began, it has been very far from midnight. Now midnight, according to the concept, it's when the, the world is, is facing a catastrophic disaster. When basically we are facing uh, like the extinction, the extinction of the apocalypse. Are you with me? The extinction of everything, animals, the human race. So basically the, the midnight uh, time there, it is actually the end. Are you with me? Now this clock is reviewed by scientists every year on the 23rd of January. Every year they review it. And then they move the time to show what their studies and their indications are saying. Do you know that this year in January, this year on the 23rd of January, the clock was moved? Or the clock rather, last year it was moved and to this year it was kept at 90 seconds to midnight. Are you with me? 90 seconds until the end. Now this is scientists speaking, not me speaking because many people I remember in the COVID crisis, they didn't want to listen to, to, to people who are carrying, you know, this wonderful book, this black book, uh, and quoting from it, and who are carrying the testimonies. They didn't want to hear anything. They only wanted to, to hear the what? The science. Now, today, the science is saying, we are at the end. Will the people then, who love the science so much, take heed and wake up? The thinking men who are studying each and every event because there are so many events taking place. You, do you hear what they are factoring here? We are told that the, the, the risk of nuclear warfare, climate change, they are factoring in the artificial intelligence, they are factoring in uh, disasters, global disasters like environmental disasters, they are, they are factoring in social unrest, political instabilities. All of these things are, are inputs into their model. And then they get a result. And since they say we're at the end, we are at the end. This is what they are saying. Listen to what this, this is the news now. Uh, independent Australia. Do, do you see what they're saying? A doomsday clock is at 90 seconds to midnight. Now this 90 seconds to midnight is not literal time, but it is a relative. Are you with me? Trying to show us how close we are to the end. Mm. And the, and the news, the news outlet here is saying, time is almost up. This is what should be heard from the pulpits. Not from news outlets, but since the, the rocks are now speaking. Why? Because those who have been appointed to speak are holding their peace. They are false watchmen who cry, who are raising the cry that everything is well. When since it is not well. I can guarantee you that like these are science saints. These are signs. I, I am now not a scientist, and but you have seen the signs that we've been looking at. I thought that let me take uh, some reputable people who are getting paid to follow these signs on a daily basis and they are inputting them on models. Are you with me? Comparing them with history, comparing sign with sign and everything, and see what they come up with. At least since people would have had an excuse not to believe the message where this doomsday clock saying, aye, we're still far from, from doomsday. But now they're saying 90 seconds. That's amazing, huh? So that is what we're facing, saints. But do you remember when the wise man came to Jerusalem, Jerusalem was fast asleep. 
the leaders of Jerusalem were fast asleep. They were fast asleep, almost, I would say, snoring. Even when the issue was brought up, uh, because the wise men, they went to Herod and Herod inquired with the leaders of the nation, the, the religious leaders, they were still fast asleep. They just said carelessly, no, the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. This is what the scripture says. And they went back to their sleep. Are you with me? Saints, let it not be the same with us. Don't hear and then after hearing, go back to sleep. There are many people who hear, having camps, having listening to sermons, and after hearing, they go back to, to sleep, saints. But we should not be doing that. Now, I want to show you a video of a man. Uh, this is a, a man who was in the military in the UK. And he is also studying these events because it says that it says that these are men of all classes. Are you with me? So these are wise men of all classes. We looked at the the, the scientists. Now these are military geniuses that I'm going to, to to be playing. I want us to hear his video. What he's saying about this this doomsday clock and the things that are taking place. Notice this. Uh, when the Soviet bloc disintegrated in 1991, it was 17 minutes away from midnight. And yesterday, uh, the clock was reset. It's reset on the 23rd of January every year. And uh, it, is, it now sits at 90 seconds to midnight. In other words, the likelihood of nuclear war has never been higher. In fact, even during the Cold War, the clock was a lot further away from midnight. So it's a recognition of everything that's going on at the moment. The... Uh, obviously, the Ukraine war and Russia there threatening nuclear weapons, you know, on a, virtually on a daily basis. So I think it is a reflection that at the moment, the world, the globe is in a really, really dangerous position. And uh, also only yesterday, the uh, International Institute for Strategic Studies in London uh, published a report saying that Putin believes he can use tactical nuclear weapons. These are they're called battlefield or smaller nuclear weapons. They're still the size of the bombs that were dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Yeah, potential to kill sort of 80 or 90,000 people in Awana. Um, this report says that Putin believes that he can use them in Ukraine and the West uh, would not react. Britain would not react with a nuclear weapon. Uh, therefore, it is a possibility. So you put all that together and it is dangerous times. Mm. Hopefully this is a really salutary wake up call. Do you hear that saying? We are told that the clock when it was in the beginning, it was very far from midnight. And even during the time of the Cold War, even the time of the fall of the Soviet Union, we are told that it was 17 minutes too. So in as much as those were very brittle times, a lot of prophecy was fulfilling then. But yet the scientists, as they look at things, they said, mm -mm, we are not, not, we are not so, so close to the end. Now, today, the scientists are saying that the end is imminent. Are you with me? This is what the scientists are saying. And one of the largely contributing factors, even though there are many, it is the risk of nuclear warfare. The risk of World War Three, as it were, saints. Are you with me? And the reason why the risk is so high now, it is because there are many nations now that are holding nuclear uh, head like nuclear weapons Russia you have Russia the United States and also I didn't show you here but I'll show you in this article it's speaking about the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un uh, who is also having you know nuclear heads and also Iran Iran people are so tyrannical and people who are so you know, uh, it, it seems as if when you're looking at things, it seems as if they're impulsive. So I'm just going to say that they seem very impulsive uh, and they are very trigger friendly. Like they don't hesitate to pull the trigger. And they also have uranium, which can help them to make uh, nuclear weapons in weeks. They can just, they all, all they need is just weeks to be making these nuclear weapons. And rumors are that they're actually busy making these nuclear weapons as we speak. So... There is a lot, there is a lot of instability, saints. A lot of instability. Something small can trigger nuclear warfare. In fact, this is what many commentators are saying. I'm just showing you what the thinking men are saying concerning what is taking place. 
concerning the the warfare that is happening in Ukraine and Russia, many many commentators say that Europe is going to enter into a war with Russia, like NATO is going to enter into a war with Russia very very soon, because there is no way that Russia, after uh, seizing Ukraine, is going to stop at that. No no no. Russia actually wants the neighboring countries, and according to a law uh, in the in, in in NATO section five, I think they say. Uh, NATO must react as soon as Russia attacks a NATO country. Are you with me? And that is going to place the world, it's going to involve the world in a, in a catastrophe sense. Because all of these nations are holding nuclear weapons. And as we speak, we are told that Vladimir Putin wants to use tactical nuclear weapons, so meaning smaller nuclear weapons, so that he can just finish Ukraine. Because as things are, because Ukraine is getting support from other nations, he is not able to do the job as he thought he would. Are you with me? And he's losing a lot of soldiers and a lot of uh, weapons as well. And so it seems likely that he's going to, to use some tactical nuclear weapons. And since that is going to trigger a very, very serious reaction. Are you with me? Notice what this man is saying concerning the war between NATO and Russia. It's like, it's imminent things. Now, I would agree with your opening summation from the Norwegians that uh, there is a possibility of conflict in the next few years. Um, the Polish uh, head of the Security Bureau thinks it's a little bit closer than that. It really depends how all the moving parts move at the moment. And if Ukraine does not prevail in holding and pushing the Russians back. If the Russians uh, move further west, the next place they will go is on a NATO country. Mm. And if the Russians step into a NATO country, we all must react. It's yeah. called Article 5. Now, I don't think, and I don't think anybody who looks at Putin closely thinks, that Putin would stop in Ukraine. Putin sees himself as the modern-day Peter the Great, who once ruled Europe. And that is what ultimately he would want to do. Mm. And again, in your opening gambit, you tell us how the Russians are building up their military. The Russians are fighting a total war. They have 600,000 soldiers alone in Ukraine. They're turning tanks out by the, t by the day, making tractor factories make tanks. Now, they've already lost 4,500 tanks in this conflict. Britain only has about 100 tanks. When I was a tank commander, third, when I joined 30 years ago, we had over 500. We had three times the size of soldiers. So, yeah, it is, it's a really salutary. Do you hear that, Saints? Like, this is now another thinking man. Uh, and an expert, I would say, when it comes to, to military things. Uh, and he's saying that the conflict, uh, two or three years' time, it is taking place now he's saying it depends on how things turn out in ukraine but he, he he's basically commenting on how he thinks that they will turn out that they as, as long as ukraine is holding off uh you know the rush the russians then things will be fine but once the russians overcome ukraine with those tactical nuclear uh, warheads and ukraine is overcome and also this the support the support is withdrawn from other nations because you saw this article that I just showed here that due to, 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 to resistance now from the American public because the, America is the biggest supporter of Ukraine uh, due to resistance from the American public and also the side of Trump it is not for supporting Ukraine in the warfare and Trump's support is also growing so should he become president Ukraine is going to see support dwindling. Are you with me, saints? And therefore, Russia is going to overcome Ukraine. And as this gentleman here has said, when that happens, Russia will enter upon the other countries. But now the problem is that the other neighboring countries, they are NATO countries, and that triggers a warfare with NATO. And the US is involved, and then Russia also calls on for help from China and the world is engulfed in, in, in disaster sense. Now, what does inspiration say about all of this? Notice now a quotation about what we are speaking about. 
So now we're hearing rumors and speculations about what might be happening. And notice uh, what inspiration is saying about these things. Testimonies, volume 6, in page 14, it says, Only a moment of time, as it were, yet, as it were, yet remains. But while already nation is rising against nation and kingdom against kingdom, there is not now a general engagement. Do you hear that? So as much as these things are happening, but there is not now a, a World War Three, as it were. There is not now a general engagement where they are full on fighting. Mm -mm. It says, as yet, the four winds are held until the servants of God shall be sealed in their foreheads. Do you hear that, saints? Do you see? Do you feel the wind blowing? Every day we are told here that there are threats of nuclear attacks, threats of nuclear warfare. Don't take those threats lightly. Don't. Don't misconstrue the mercy of God just, that, just because God is withholding the winds. And you don't, you don't feel the full force of the winds. Don't think that there are no winds that are threatening. Are you with me? Many people say, no, no, it's just rumors. No. You, you see that as a sleeping man's mentality. A man who is awake will say that, wow, the winds are really preparing to blow. But praise be to God that the angels are still holding them back. We are told that the general engagement will only take place when the angels let go. It says in the blue words, let me start in the red words again, it says, as yet the four winds are held until the servants of God shall be sealed in their foreheads. It says, then the powers of earth will marshal their forces for the last great battle. So we're told that this will be the last battle. After this, no one will be battling with anyone because there will be no one to battle with. Are you with me? 90 seconds to this moment, the scientists say. Now, if you understand prophecy and the four winds that are spoken of in Revelation chapter 7, you will understand that this means the close of probation. Are you with me? The four winds are released only at the close of all human probation. The four winds are released at the beginning of the time of trouble. They represent the wrath of God. Are you with me, saints? So the general engagement that, what, that we see these thinking men speaking about, I believe that it is going to take place. Uh, after the close of probation. But since the events are showing that this general engagement it is threatening so, so greatly, and the events are showing that it is, it is so, so imminent, they're saying two years, three years, some are saying even less, are you with me? And everything that is pointing towards the, the, the direction of the general engagement, it is taking place. So if that is the case, that the general engagement is about to take place. And inspiration says it will only take place when the four winds have been released and probation is closed. What must then that tell you as someone who's watching the signs? The winds are about to be released. The winds are about to be released, saints, and probation is about to close. And that tells you that the mark of the beast crisis, the Sunday law, is even nearer, saints. It is even nearer. It is imminent. It, we should take it as something that is happening like in a few days time. Though we don't know the time. Are you with me? But that is how near it is. We should take it as something that is taking place in a few days time. That is how we should be prepared. Saints, because I don't, know what we want, I don't know what we want to see. I don't know what we want God to say. But what I am saying, saints, as the Lord is showing these events and these quotations, that the close of probation is imminent. It is very, very imminent. Very, very imminent. Now, I want us to look at the study that I mentioned. The preparation to receive the seal of God. This study, like I mentioned, is something that is very, very highly neglected. Highly, highly neglected and not on purpose. But Satan has, has really come in, saints, and he has diverted our attentions from this important truth. Because we know that with him, everything depends upon his diverting the mind from Jesus and his truth. That's Great Controversy, page 488. Whenever Satan is working, what he depends upon the most, uh, it is the fact that when he brings a temptation, it will find our minds diverted from Jesus and his truth. 
Never allow your mind to be diverted from the man of Calvary. That is, that is the center of all attraction, saints. That is, that, is, that is the man at which all angels, even today, they marvel when they view his sacrifice. Are you with me? Never allow your mind for once to be diverted from the man of Calvary. Don't allow it. Don't allow it. Do you know, saints, when Jesus was given as a sacrifice, when sin entered into the world and the plan of salvation, we are told, uh, had been had been set up long before the creation of the entire world. So even long before the creation of a sinner, the plan of salvation was already set up. Are you with me? But we are told in, in Petrus and Prophets, page 63, that when sin came in, saints, there is a divine counsel that began that set as to what would be done. But the plan was already there. Are you with me? But the father was looking at the plan. And the son was looking at the plan of salvation saints. They are not drawing up a new plan. And when you read there in Peter's Prophets, page 63, it says that long continued was that mysterious communing, the council of peace. It says they continued for long. Now, you might wonder, why did they continue for so long if the plan was already there and was there from eternity? Are you with me? The answer is given in the same quotation. We are told that it was a struggle. It was a struggle even with the king of the universe to give up his son. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that those who believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you see, saints, the magnitude of the love? I mean, the Bible says that there is nothing hard for God. Are you with me? So you don't imagine God struggling with something. But when it came to giving his son, we are told that the, the king of the universe struggled. It was not an easy thing, saints. But the, the magnitude of the love that God has for us, it overcame that struggle. You will never hear in the Bible it say that God struggles about something. God doesn't struggle. But when it came to this gift, it was a struggle. And that is why we are told in page 69 that when even, even when they let the angels know concerning the plan, what is going to take place, that Jesus is going to come on earth and die. Jesus is going to be born as a babe. Page 69 says it was the marvel of all the universe that Christ should humble himself to save humanity. They marvel the whole universe, not just the angels in heaven, but even in other unfallen worlds, we are told that they marveled. Think about that. That is for you. Not for everyone, but for you. Everyone should see this as having happened for them individually. The love of God for you is so, so great. Don't allow your mind to be diverted from Jesus and his truth. Now, this truth we are looking at, it is something that Satan has sought to divert people's minds from. Let me just pray. Let me just pray again before we enter into this truth. Very short, short truth, but very important. Let's, let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we... We thank you for, for your love, for the things that you have been pleased to reveal to us, especially concerning the imminent close of probation. Lord, we don't know the time, but the signs are showing that it is imminent. And Lord, we are told that it is hastening greatly. Please, Lord, help us to be prepared to overcome all sin and to hate sin so, so badly. Because, Lord, how can we be hastening towards the globe of probation while we are continuing to sin. Please, Lord, fill our hearts with love. Help us. I really, really beg. And now for the study, I'm pleading for, for your Holy Spirit that you may speak, Lord, to us. Speak through me, Lord, through your Spirit. Uh, because I'm just a child, Lord. So if I'm speaking alone, my own words, oh, Lord, people are just going to be lost. So, Lord, I'm really pleading that you may Take charge of my mouth and my thoughts and speak. I ask in the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Now, saints, come with me in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs, chapter 1. 
Proverbs chapter 1, what is going to happen on probation closes. Proverbs chapter 1 says, in verse 28, it says, Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. It says, They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Why? It says, For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Do you hear that? Listen now to verse 30. It says, They would none of my counsel. Hmm? They despised all my reproof. So God is saying the reason why probation is going to close on people and they will seek the Lord and will not find him. It is because people are rejecting God's counsel. In fact, when you study the history of Israel, saints, you will see that that is what leads to the closing of probation. The events are not leading to the close of probation. They are merely showing that it is about to close. But what leads to the close of probation, it is the stubbornness of human hearts. When you read, we're not going to go there now, but you can go there in your own time. When you read from 2 Chronicles chapter 36, from verse 14, just study there what caused the probation of Israel to close. God, God says it, says the people had rebelled and God sent his messengers because he loved them and he had compassion on his dwelling place. But we're told that the people mocked the messengers. Are you with me? We're told that they misused the prophets until there was no remedy for them. And like now, we are told in Proverbs that what will cause probation to close is when people neglect the counsels of the Lord. Do you heed the counsels? There are counsels that deal with the relationships. There are counsels that deal with how we raise our children. There are counsels that deal with, with, with how we conduct our homes. Are you with me? There are counsels that deal with with appetite, counsels on diet and foods. Are you with me, saints? Do we heed the counsels? There are counsels that they deal with relationships in church. Where the Bible is very clear that even if we become angry, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Don't hold grudges. Are you with me? Those are all God's counsels. Do you heed the counsel of the Lord? Listen to what it says again in Proverbs chapter 1, in verse 24. Now here, I want to show saints. Okay, before I read verse 24, I want to say something. You know, when you speak about the close of probation, people don't understand that this is going to be a very terrible day. Did you see what it, it said in Nehemiah? We are told there that the mighty men are going to weep bitterly. Did you hear that verse? Mighty men are going to cry bitterly. It is not an ordinary day, saints. It is not an ordinary day. When you read, that is now Zephaniah, when you read in Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 6, he says, let, he, he says, let me ask, have you ever seen a man giving birth? Do men give birth to children? And then the answer is that no. He says, how come I see men holding, holding themselves here on their loins, and all the men are in pain and they are crying as if they are women giving birth. It says, and the faces are turned into paleness. Hmm? And then it says in the next verse, in verse 7, it says, this is the time of Jacob's trouble. Terrible is that day, saints. That day, what is going to happen very soon, saints, don't take it lightly. It is terrible. You know what the Bible says in Isaiah 28, in verse 21? It says, that the Lord shall rise up as in Mount Perizim, and he shall be wrought as in the valley of Gibeon, that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his act, his strange act. What God is going to do, saints, it is a strange thing. When Jeremiah looked in Jeremiah chapter 4, he says that he saw only dead bodies which were not buried. Are you with me? And the earth was as a wilderness. Oh, saints, let us be warned. You know that the plagues that are going to fall upon the earth are terrible. They're so, so terrible. But they are not universal. They're going to be falling on certain continents, certain countries, and others are, just, are left only to hear about it, while other plagues are going to be coming to them. Are you with me? Now, when you read in Isaiah chapter 28, in verse 19, we are told that even those that shall hear of them, we are told that it is going to be a vexation only to understand the report. So even just those who hear about it, they are going to be vexed. 
So what I'm saying, saints, is that what is about to happen, like we cannot describe, I cannot describe it. Even the most vivid representation, saints, cannot reach the magnitude of the true ordeal. Great Controversy 6 to 22. So it's going to be bad, very bad. In fact, when you read here, when you read in Great Controversy, page 627, it says, the severity of the retribution awaiting the transgressor may be judged by the Lord's reluctance, by the Lord's reluctance to execute justice. Are you with me? We're told that there are two things. There is justice, where the transgressor receives the full wrath of God, which is the retribution, meaning the just punishment for his sins. Are you with me? That is justice. Now, we are told that the, 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 the punishment is so severe that God is reluctant to execute the justice. Are you with me? Now, when God doesn't execute, execute justice, are you, you, know, you know what it does, which is also still justice, but now it's, it's another form. What God does is that he exercises mercy. So what God wants to do actually for all of us is to exercise what? Mercy, saints. His hand is stretched out towards us calling us to repent. Notice what the Lord says in Proverbs chapter 1, in verse 24. It says, Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. You know, when I first read this verse, I had a picture of the Lord God, omnipotent, all-wise, all-knowing, all-powerful, having all things. I had a picture of him standing, in like almost like a play field and we, we were like children and he is calling out he wants to help his hand is stretched out and children are busy doing what they want they're just busy playing and they're ignoring this call everyone is busy, is busy with their own business and this call is being slighted lightly treated that is what he's saying here saints and yet the reason why he is busy calling it is because he would rather exercise mercy than to punish injustice. Are you with me? God wants to exercise mercy, saints. He is always looking for an excuse to forgive us. Notice what he says in Jeremiah chapter 8. Let's go to Jeremiah 8 in verse 6. In Jeremiah 8 verse 6, listen to what he says. He says this is God speaking to rebellious Israel. Now, anyone has studied the history of Israel, they will know how rebellious Israel was in the days of Jeremiah. God says, I hearkened and heard, meaning I listened. I waited and I listened. It says, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? Mm. Everyone turned to his course as the horse rushed into the battle. Do you hear that? Imagine God saying, people are busy sinning, left, right, and cent center. There are those who are committing adultery. There are those who are committing fornication. There are those who are stealing. There are those who are holding grudges. There are those who are gossiping. There are those who are deliberately spreading falsehoods, knowing that this is false, and yet they continue to speak lies about others. And what God is doing... While there are those who are doing all of these things, there are those who are drinking alcohol. There are those who are intemperate, all oh, saints. While all of these things are happening, God says he brought his ear near. And he listened. He just wanted to hear even just one person saying, oh Lord, I repent. What have I done? Why have I done this? The Lord wanted to hear that. But he says, as he listened, saints, can you see the mercy of God? Do you know that to get God's attention, it's not a hard thing? Because you can see that he is listening even while people are not speaking. He is listening because he is so desperate to hear them speak to him, confessing their sins. It says, I hearkened. It says, but no one spoke aright and nobody repented, saying, what have I done? That's true repentance. When you are horrified. When you are horrified at what you have done, you say, Lord, what have I done? Lord, have mercy on me. Are you with me? It's true repentance. 
And God says there was none. Saints, I would really urge, let us take this opportunity to give our lives completely and fully to Jesus. Because Jesus, as we are speaking, he is listening. Don't think that it is a hard thing to give your life to Jesus. Jesus wants your life. He wants to have it already. Don't think that you will need to convince him. Are you with me? Don't allow Satan to deceive you that you have gone too far to return and you cannot be forgiven. Jesus is waiting to hear even a muffled prayer, a prayer that is just so, you know, making no sense. But as long as he descends the penitence and he hears the plea pleading for forgiveness, the Lord stretches out his mighty hand. Hmm? And you become a brand plucked out of the fire. Saints, let not the sun set without making things right with God. Like I said, the mark of, of the beast is so near. We should take it as though it is a few days away. Because we've seen here that the close of probation is very near. If the close of probation is near, then the mark of the peace is even nearer. Are you with me? All right. Now, I want to get to something. So we were speaking about repentance and God's willingness to forgive. That he even, he even draws near and listens to just hear a confession, an, exp an, an, an expression of, of penitence. He's just waiting, but people are just busy with their things. Now, notice what also God is waiting to see. Now, this is the part that I believe that is greatly, greatly neglected. Come with me to Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 13, 31. Now, the book of Ezekiel, it's, it's, it's like relentless in speaking about the destruction that Israel is going to be destroyed with. Uh, this is actually foretelling the destruction uh, of Israel in the days of Zedekiah. Now it says here, and I, verse 30, is Ezekiel 22, Ezekiel 22, verse 30, says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found none. Do you hear that? God is saying he was looking for a man. That will make up the hedge. There's been a hedge. There's been a gap. There's a gap between people and God. And God is saying he sought for a man to make up the hedge. To stand in the gap before the Lord for the land. That he should not destroy it. But he says he found none. Then what follows? He says, therefore have I poured out mine indignation upon them. Do you hear that saints? Do you see what God is saying? It's as if he's saying, had there been a man... Those people or some of the people would have been spared. They would not have received of the wrath of the Lord had there been a man that is busy interceding for them. Do you hear that? Had there been a man who is busy interceding for them. Now there's been such a man. That is the man Jesus. Are you with me? Jesus is interceding for us. But God is also looking for men upon the earth who will be interceding for their brethren. Who will be interceding for their families? Are you with me, saints? Do you hear that? Imagine God saying, imagine God saying, let's say you, you, you are now studying, you, you, are, you are now reviewing the books in heaven and you see that at, at a particular year, your family member died and their probation closed. That was the probation, their close of probation. And, and as you look at the face of Jesus, Jesus says, you know, before the, before the provision of that person closed, and let's say that is your family member, it might be your parents, it might be your brother or sister, it might be someone you, you love very dearly, but they are not in the truth. They, they, they're just, you know, doing whatever they want. Now imagine Jesus saying to you, do you know that before the provision of that person closed, I looked, I looked for a man or a woman that was going to make up the hedge, that I was going to stand in the gap between me and that person so that his probation does not close. And then he says, but as I looked, I found no person. Are you with me, saints? Do you, can you imagine how painful your heart would be to know that you, you also don't remember yourself standing in the gap, endlessly interceding 
for the ones whom you love. Are you with me? This is the work that you have been given, saints, by the Lord God of heaven. To intercede for those whom you love. Ima just imagine, there is someone in church that you love very, very greatly. And we ought to be loving. Like, basically, intercession, do you know what this intercession is? It is a test of love. Because love for someone will lead you to, to intercede for them when you see that they are lost. But if you are going to see that someone is lost and you don't even you don't even utter a prayer to the Lord for their salvation, you, you can't how can you say you love them? Are you with me? So that is why this is a test for the seal of God. The intercession is a test for the seal of God. We cannot receive the seal of God if we don't love those who don't love us, if we don't love those who are impenitent. Are you with me? We cannot receive the seal of God because we receive the seal of God when we are like God. The seal of God, like as Jesus says in the book of Matthew, when he speaks about how that we should, we should love even those that hate us, beginning in verse 44, he says that we should do this so that we may be the children of our Father who is in heaven because he does the same. Are you with me? So you are not a child of God unless you love even those that hate you. You love even those who hate the truth and you pray for them. And if you are not a child of God, if you don't belong to him, then you cannot receive his seal. Are you with me? Because the seal does not make you belong to God, but the seal is an evidence that you belong to him. Are you with me? The Bible says in Revelation that God seals his servants. Hmm? Not that the seal makes them his servants. I hope that is clear, saints. That's why now when you, re when you read Ezekiel chapter 9, in verse 4, the prerequisite of receiving the seal as the scourge is about to go out and people are about to be destroyed, the prerequisite of receiving the seal, it is that you need to be sighing and crying for the abominations that are done in the land. The sighing and crying is not gossiping about people's sins or it is not speaking about the, the people's sins. Are you with me? But it is about praying about them, crying even tears. Can you imagine that love that you'd need to have for the sinner? Sighing and crying. It is upon those that the seal of God is going to be placed, saints. Notice what, notice what inspiration says concerning this. Okay, before I read these quotations, let me just read the, the last two verses and then we were going to read the last quotations. Like, this is something that is clear in all the Bible, but we, we haven't seen it. Notice the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 17. What is the work of, of, of God's people, especially of, of those who minister, of those who are ministers of the Lord? Joel, chapter 2, in verse 17, says, let the priests the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, hmm? and give not the inheritance to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? We are told that the ministers of the Lord ought to be standing between the porch and the altar, saints. And they ought to be to be interceding in a manner that we don't like we don't realize also god says the same thing in the book of samuel in first samuel chapter 12 in verse 23 samuel says to the israelites when they had sinned so much that they said they don't want god they want another king and they were adding sin upon sin and they come to samuel and say man we have added to all of our sins, this one sin now of, of asking for a king. So we, we have sinned very greatly. You know what Samuel said? Samuel says, I, the Lord will forgive you. God won't forsake you if you just continue to follow the Lord. And then he says in verse 23, And as for me, says, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for thee. But I will teach you the right and the good way. Are you with me? So do you see the two things that he mentions in this verse? He says, I'm going to pray for you. And it should be a sin for me to cease to pray for you. Are you with me? Then he says, I'll, I'll not only pray, I'm also going to teach you. But many of us, we think that the only important thing is the teaching, teaching, teaching. Such that when people don't want to listen to the teaching, we think that it's over. But saints, we need to intercede 
Do you remember Abraham? How he prayed for Sodom. Do you remember saints? When Abraham was praying, he didn't say to the Lord, Lord, please, when you arrive there, please just take out Lord. Make sure you take out Lord. That's not what he said. He said, Lord, please spare Sodom. And his thought was that, I know Lord is righteous, and I know that he would have evangelized. Maybe there are some people, maybe even 10. Are you with me? So he was praying that Sodom may be spared. But Sodom could not be spared. Not even one, not even 10 righteous people were found in the entire city, saints. But what, what motivated the prayer of Abraham? Notice this. In Patrick and Prophets, page 140, it says, love for perishing souls inspired Abraham's prayer. This is the same love we need before we can be sealed. Are you with me? His love for perishing souls inspired Abraham's prayer. While he loathed or he hated the sins of that corrupt city, he desired that the sinners might be saved. His deep interest for Sodom shows the anxiety that we should feel for the impenitent. Huh? It says, we should cherish hatred of sin, but pity and love for the sinner. Hmm? All around us are souls going down to ruin as hopeless, as terrible, as that which befell Sodom. Every day the probation of some is closing. Every hour some are passing beyond the reach of mercy. Where are those who with humility and persevering faith are pleading with God for him? Hmm? Where are those who are pleading for the impenitent saints? That is the question that is asked here. Where are those who are pleading with God for the impenitent? We are told that what motivated Abraham's earnest appeal. Do you remember where he began? He began at 50. He kept going down 40, kept going down. And he says, Lord, please let me ask, even though I am just but dust. This man was not pretending. Are you with me? He really felt a burden for the salvation of the Sodomites. Not that they may continue in sin, but he, he wanted them to be saved from sin. Where are those who are going to plead like Abraham? Now I'm going to read for you a very interesting experience. I'm going to read for you the experience of Ellen White. And you know, someone might be asking, Hey, but Lord, why must I be praying so much? I'm going to read the experience so that we can see this. I'm going to read the experience of Ellen White uh, when she was, when she had just experienced, you know, a thorough conversion of heart. And she began to labor for souls just before the disappointment. Uh, and I want us to see how she labored for the souls. And I want us to see the results. This is so, so amazing. This was just but a mere, mere teenager doing this. Can can you, can you believe that? Like she was but a mere teenager when doing this. It says here that a number, now I'm reading from Testimonies, volume 1, page 33. She's speaking about what happened when she was inviting her friends. Uh, and she would be sharing also her experience, her testimony with them. How that she, she actually, you know, she was convicted and been converted by the Lord. It's a very, very wonderful experience. If you want to read it, go and read uh, chapter 3. Uh, of Testimonies Volume 1. Very, very amazing. So she would share the Bible and she would share her experience with these friends. Now notice, notice what would happen, saints. She says here, a number of them were vain and thoughtless. My experience sounded to them like an idle tale, and they did not heed my entreaties. But I determined that my efforts should never cease till these dear souls for whom I had so great an interest yield to God. Are you with me? A teenager, she was a mere teenager here since. But she's doing this. Then she says, Several entire nights were spent by me in earnest prayer for those whom I had sought out and brought together for the purpose of laboring and praying with them. Are you with me? She said that she had prayed entire nights for them. Even though they were vain and they, they were careless, they didn't, know, they didn't even believe what she's saying. So what she did, she, she said, I just prayed for them entire nights. Now notice the result. He says, I continued to exhort and pray for each one separately. 
until everyone had yielded to Jesus, acknowledging the merits of his pardoning love, everyone was converted to God. Can you believe that? Where you are laboring for people and every one of them, they, are, they, they become converted. This is a remarkable result. It is because she followed this God-ordained plan of interceding with the Lord, praying to the Lord for people. Are you with me? Now one can be asking, oh Lord, but why, why must I pray so much in order for my family to be saved? Oh, you know, saints, let us just leave the why aside for now. But let me give you a quotation. You know, when you read in the book, Prayer, page 61, it says it is part of God's plan to grant us in answer to our prayers of faith that which he would not bestow had we not thus prayed. Are you with me? So we're told that this is part of God's plan to grant us in answer to our prayers of faith that which he would not thus bestow. Did we not thus ask? Are you with me, saints? So this is part of God's plan. Now, why he does this, it's a study we are going to have another time. But you must understand that there are certain things that God wants to give you, but he will not give you unless you ask. There are certain people that God can convert in your family, in your household, in, in your community, but God will not unless you thus ask. Do you see what Eleanor did here? This teenager says, she says that I, I spent entire nights praying for them. She says, I determined that my efforts will not cease. Mm. So we are told, saints, that what drives such an effort, it is love. When you look at someone and you look at the destruction, the wrath that is about to come, when you look at the... Hey, the pain that is going to come upon them should they not repent. And the love leads you to fall on your knees and to bleed. Many people say, oh, my family doesn't hear me when I share the gospel. It's fine, then pray. You know, we're told in the same page, uh, prayer page 61, we're told that by our fervent prayers of faith, we can move the arm that moves the world. Do you hear that? So when you pray, prayer actually moves the arm that moves the world. So in as much as you can't move the world, you can move people's hearts. But you are told that when you pray, you are moving the arm that is able to move those people's hearts. So we need to pray for people's saints. Let us pray for the church of God. Let's pray for families, for friends. Anyone you want to be converted, we need to intercede. Are you with me? I'll repeat again. Ezekiel chapter 22, before I close, verse 20. God says, And I sought for a man that would make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. But I found none. He says, but I found none. May we be those men and women. Because without being those men and women, we will not receive the seal of the living God. Let us close in prayer. Righteous Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, O oh Lord, we thank you so much for showing us that time is just about finished, Lord. And showing us also what we need to do in order for us, Lord, uh, to participate in the glories of the coming world. To show us, Lord, also what we need to do if we want our loved ones to be saved. Even if, Lord, this this intercession, this intercessory spirit was not a, a prerequisite of receiving the seal. But surely, Lord, love for souls that have been bought at such a great cost should move us to, to really, really intercede. But Lord, we are as men that are just bewitched and asleep. We allow people to go into ruin without even making a, an attempt to tell them the truth and without even making an attempt to intercede for them. Please, Father, I really pray personally for forgiveness and I pray that you may forgive not only me, but all of us, Lord. Uh, like, yeah, Father, please really forgive us and please infuse in our hearts, Lord, and a, a spirit of earnest prayer. That is what I'm really, really pleading. Help us, Lord, even with the preparations that we need to make uh, for the crisis that is about to come upon the world as an overwhelming surprise. 
Please, Lord, help us. We plead in the name of Jesus Christ. And we thank you for hearing us and for loving us thus. Oh, Lord, your love is so amazing. Thank you. I really love you and thank you, Lord. We ask all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And as for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. I want to be.